When we 
tell you, man, today is uh, Pentecostal Sunday. Well, tomorrow at the time of this recording, it's Saturday now. The comforter will come. The comforter will come. And he will mm, into all truth. I think that's, uh, who was that? I think that's Hawkins. Edwin Hawkins. The comforter has come. I don't know how to play it, never played it before, but I remember that song back in the 80s, I think it is. Man, I gotta find that. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. Oh, true. And I know it was a minor thing. I wrote a song, y'all, called Acts Chapter 2. I sang it at the end of the show, right? I wrote this song in the 1980s, late 1980s. Choir, choirs, I taught it to choirs when I would travel throughout the country. You've never heard it, but you will today. <laughs> I'm going to play it and sing it if I can remember it. All right, I'll see y'all in a minute. you thinking and where the topics are hot feel free to comment whether we agree or not cuz he's got something to say sir walter jones sir walter jones he's got something to say sir walter jones sir walter jones jones Come on in. The water's fine. Do 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 do. Hello, everybody. Elder Walter Jones of the Faith Temple Church of God in Christ, 1932 Dewey Avenue in Evanston, Illinois. I'm going to leave my keyboard over here because I'm going to pull it out at the end of the show, okay? So just ignore it over there doing whatever it's doing in there. Why is it trying to disappear? <laughs> ignore it. Um, today it might be a little lengthy, so uh, buckle up. You can't talk about the Holy Spirit in five minutes. You can. Hey, you'll miss some stuff. What they did today is they decided to um, get, in, get in front of the story. The story is this book right here is to start the new quarters in the Sunday School lesson. But it's called God's Call for Justice. They were getting ready to do uh, uh, start another, a new lesson series on justice. But I think the people who uh, decided to put this book together forgot that tomorrow is first is, is Pentecostal Sunday. So it starts off with rules, rules for just living. Y'all know I have a list with, with these with these teethuses. <laughs> it's kind of hard for me to talk. Uh, Exodus 23 is where they will, would have gone tomorrow. But. Um, thank God that the Church of God in Christ decided uh, through our local body here in First Jurisdiction and our dear sister, Dr. Rella Milam, had a big part. She's a member here. And those of you who were part of our our um, Sunday School University uh, for the eight weeks, she is the one over our education department at our church. She was very, very instrumental with a couple others who wrote up today's lesson. So I'm going to try and teach out of Acts chapter 2. It's a biggie. We'll be jumping all over the place, but we've got to find a timeline from the beginning where we saw some hints of what the Holy Ghost was getting ready to do. Then we got to take you from the Egyptians, I'm sorry, the Jews, <laughs> and how God was teaching them through what's called the feasts. To prepare for that, Jesus then came. And then he began to teach on the Holy Spirit. He did something to the disciples. He says, I'm going away, but don't worry. I'm going to send you someone. Acts chapter 2 come on the scene. And then we see the, uh, the revealing of the Old Testament. Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. So when we read out of Leviticus and, and Joel and Exodus, 
we see the New Testament concealed. By the time we get to uh, Acts chapter 2, we see the Old Testament revealed. Many of the Jews then realize, uh-oh. So in this book here, called The Feasts of the Lord, gets you a good secular book. Uh, it's, not, it's not really as, it's, it's secular, yes, but it's, it's the spiritual culture of the Jewish people. This one is by Kevin and Marvin, all right? There are many books out there. This gives you all of the feasts that were celebrated by them. It talks more on a, on a cultural level, more so than anything, and then it'll bring up some scriptures for you people who need to dig into why. All right? So it's for a secular audience as well as a spiritual uh, audience. So if you open this up, mm -hmm. if you open up the book, okay, Hey man, I'm looking at, I'm trying to see some of y'all's comments there. Sometimes I'd be missing some good stuff. Hey, is Dinah here? Somebody mentioned Dinah. Where's Dinah? Hmm? Dinah here? Show missed that girl. I think she was here yesterday, was it, wasn't she? Hey man, we're going to keep praying for her, for her healing. That is our, that is the bunker's sweetheart. Dinah is the bunker's sweetheart. <laughs> All of us. All right. Okay, right here, it uh, gives you the con table of contents. The overview of the spring feast, the fall feasts, the Jewish time, Passover. All right. These are the, I'm going to read these. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Shabbat, feast of weeks. Here's where it starts. The seventh, the seventh feast. Then Rosh Hashanah, the feast of trumpets, feast of weeks. Uh, I'm sorry, the day of atonement. All right. Shabbat. It goes on and on. All right. When you get to uh, the, the Shabbat, which is the Feast of Weeks, that is what we will be dealing with today. You turn to page 88. Mm -hmm. When you turn to page 88, uh, you'll see their introduction, biblical observation. It gives you a, a, a nice little secular story at the beginning. That's why I like this book, because it, it, it helps it gives both natural and spiritual holidays are almost universally celebrated on special calendar dates. All right. They're giving you the secular. Uh, they're talking about Shabbat here. Just the opposite is true for the Jewish feast of Shabbat, Israel's fourth hol holy day. This is the fourth holy day. No date is associated with it in the Bible. Yet ask any observant Jew concerning Shabbat and he will answer that it is always celebrated 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. Whenever you all are doing teaching, your pastor, your, your, your teachers are doing teaching on first, uh, first Fruits and if they are not saying that you, if they're not bringing up the fact that you are a type of first fruit, then they are missing the whole teaching. Usually first fruits, when it's taught, it's taught about money and tithe. But you're missing the whole point. Mm -hmm. Here, names are very important in the ancient Jewish world. Reflect the, uh, the significant character, history, or meaning of that to which they were attached. Three separate names were used by the Jewish scriptures for the Feast of Shabbat, meaning weeks. Each name emphasized a different fact of observance. All right. Hag HaShabbat, meaning the Feast of Weeks. Now, when you get down here, you'll see they gave you the first, they gave you the, the, the second, the primary, the, the, the day of first fruits. All right. We'll, we'll get there in a minute. Here, right here, was the day of which the first fruit offerings of the summer wheat crop were brought to the temple. This right here is very important. If you don't understand Acts chapter 2 in this sense, you won't get the full, full meaning. Summer wheat crop brought to the temple. So this day marked the beginning of the summer wheat harvest, even as Israel's early feast of first fruits marked the beginning of the spring Harley, barley, I'm sorry, harvest. So right here, 
then they what they did was they try and help you find it. Reflecting the fact that this festival was the official beginning of the summer harvest season. In ad addition to the biblical designation, the Talmud and Josephus referred to this festival as at Zeret, meaning conclusion. They viewed Shabbat as a conclusion of the Passover season and of the seven weeks spring harvest, since there are no other major Jewish ho holy days until the autumn. Here where they bring in Acts chapter 2. Again, secular book. In the Greek language, Shabbat was known as Pentecost, meaning 50th, since it was celebrated on the 50th day. Now, that might be good basic information by itself. But when you keep reading, they take you through a journey. Let me remove this. They take you through a journey of what uh, the Feast of Pentecost was. All right. Giving t of the Torah, the synagogue, food, stay up all night. All right. This stuff is going to sound familiar to y'all. Acts chapter 2, when you read it, when the day of Pentecost fully come, they were all in one place, one accord, okay? And then they tell you about the fulfillment of this feast. Again, this is like on a secular basis. A.D. 30, it was a hot morning late in the month of May when the day of Shabbat came that year. The fiery topaz of a Judean sun was already high above the horizon. Several hours along on its day trip, trek, a thin blanket of low-lying morning clouds had long since disappeared in the presence of its heat, leaving only a clear blue sky above Jerusalem. Very important, y'all. Mm -hmm. In the stillness of the mid-morning air, the temple Shek Harit morning, which means morning service, could be heard as it concluded. The blast of silver trumpets, the thunder of worshipers praying in unison, the solitary voice of the reader chanting from Ezekiel to Habakkuk. Now, you don't see this necessarily in Acts chapter 2, what they were doing. We just know that they were on one accord. But here are specifics to what they were doing in Acts chapter 2. This is the tale of uh, Josephus and other uh, of the uh, hist historians. Throngs of Jewish worshipers crowded the temple courts. Since Shabbat was a pilgrim holiday, many were uh, conspicuously visiting from other countries throughout the Middle East. This here will make sense about all of the tongues. North Africa, Europe, and Asia. There it is, suddenly. That is the name of the title of today's lesson, suddenly. From high overhead, the roar of a violent windstorm was heard. But how could this be? There were no clouds. There were no breeze. It was the wrong time of the year for a storm. The worshipers stood confused, searching the cloudless sky to find the source of the disturbance. The sound began to change as if it were descending towards the west. Several hundred men in the outer court rushed out of the south gate, southwest gate, past the temple guards, and onto the towering steps leading down to the city below from the lofty vantage point, the momentary flashes of what seemed like swirling bits of fire from one of the nearby houses below caught their attention. Again, Acts 2 don't deal with all these specifics. Let's just try to get to the story as quick as possible. The men paused while shouting and pointing towards the house. What could this wind and fire mean? Could this be what they had just heard from Ezekiel and Habakkuk? Could it be that the Shekinah glory was returning to Israel after some 600 years? The crowd pushed, determined to know the matter. In a few moments, they had reached the house and were pounding on the door. 
Had not 12 men from inside pushed their way to the streets, the door surely would have been broken down. This goes on and on. This is the secular tale of Pentecost, of Acts chapter 2, that you don't see in the Bible. And this is why I keep telling you all who are King James, especially Bible thumpers, you will never get the whole meaning of God's love towards you in history, Bible history, unless you dig outside of the text and read the accounts of others that were there. All right. When I try, when I talk to secular people or atheists or agnostics, I always uh, many cases, most cases, I go to the science books, the physical science books, the earth science books, the biology books. I, I go there because I believe in science, unlike some of you who are Christians who are anti-intellectualists and anti-science. Y'all against it, even though God himself made the science. That's why he's called I'm not what. So I look at the science. God has given men intelligence enough to to uh, create a microscope and dig deep into the cells and look at what God has put there. He, he put, he, he created the earth and then he, he signed his signature everywhere and he left clues and residue of himself all over the world. And so the scripture says it is the, it is the, the uh, honor of the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the honor of Kings to dig this thing up. You can read that scripture and interpret it two different ways. Uh, so I'm going to interpret it in the secular way or the natural way is that God, he, he hides stuff for man to seek it out. If you knock, seek, search him out, you will find him. So many who study the stars and, and the, the evolutions and, and all of these things, even those who dig into mystic mysticism and, anthropologists every time they go digging and searching they find God and then they do Romans chapter 1 they reject him Paul wrote this brilliant depiction of how man looks at the creation and start worshiping the creation and not the creator and he says you are without excuse because the truth was put in you at birth and you see the truth and you that's why there's no such thing as an atheist so this book has given us the tale of what happened on Acts chapter 2 that you may not have ever seen if you don't just, if you, if you leave the Bible open and go out there and search out what others are saying. And the others who say these things is the further proof and confirmation. Jesus was talking to the disciples and he asked them a very important question. What was that? Who do men say I am? I know what y'all think I am, but I want to know who are these worldly men out there? What are they saying about me? Because that's important because that can help you all who are disciples. And Jesus had many disciples more than the 12. That will help y'all understand that it's proof that what I am is who I am when the world recognize this do y'all understand what i'm saying and so they begin to say no you you ever you jeremiah you isaiah isaiah which is isaiah and then they're they going on and on and they're bringing up these names that these men knew because these are jews and they know about the torah so of course they're gonna bring up these names and jesus says okay who do you say i am bruh mm -hmm. all right so I need to bring this up so y'all can see that there's a bigger story in the scripture and how God dealt with us on the day of Pentecost than what you may see in Acts chapter 2. And, and if all of it was written, our books would be much thicker. Much thicker. Mm -hmm. So where do I go with that? So then what we can do is we can build a timeline uh, uh, let's go to Leviticus, I don't know, chapter 23. And Leviticus chapter 23 is where we see. 
Mm-hmm. Come on, what's the word on the street? There you go. Who do who who do who who do they say I am? Mm-hmm. Who? Um where am I? Right here. Mm-hmm. Beverly Williams, bless it to you, my dear sister. Okay, right here is telling us Leviticus 23. And if you go down to the 15th verse, you'll see here is here are the festival of harvest from the day after the Sabbath, the day after the Sabbath. And that's where you start counting. Mm -hmm. The day you bring the bundle of grain to be filled up as a special offering, count off seven full weeks. Keep counting until the day after the seventh Sabbath. 50 days later. There it is. Then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. Here it is. You are the new grain. From wherever you live, bring two loaves of bread to be, and he gives you all of the natural stuff that he told you to do in these feasts. You are the new grain. So when you, when you see it in Leviticus, the feast, they just figured they were doing stuff that they were supposed to do in the Mosaic law. The prophet Joel picked it up in Joel chapter 2 and you start at the 28th verse and then you'll see where the first prophecy kicked off. The Lord promised of his spirit. And I don't, they just didn't understand fully what Joel was saying here. They didn't get it. I don't think they got it. Like today, we still don't get the, the working of the Holy Spirit. We still don't get it. And I know we say the, but that is something that has been in, in etched in us and it's hard for us to get away from saying the Holy Spirit because really he's, he's Holy Spirit. Okay, that's, <laughs> that, that's what you call him. You don't call me the Walter, <laughs> all right? Unless you're saying the, the Sir Walter Jones show. All right, but it's 10 o'clock. thank you. But we'll we'll keep saying the because it is it, it's not that easy to, to break a, a fifty seven year <laughs> habit like that. Y'all understand? So here he says, then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit. After doing all what things? All these things above here. Then I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. Mm -hmm. And I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark. The moon will turn the, the blood. Every time I see a blood moon, I get these phone calls uh, with these text messages from folks say, oh, well, the coming of the Lord is near. Here's, an, here's, an, here's another, another blood moon. <laughs> and I'll be like, okay, all right, all right. I'm going to let you have that moment. Before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives, but everyone who, everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For those, for, for some on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, will escape. Now, Jesus spoke of the, the running and escaping due to the, the uh, son of perdition. Just as the Lord has said, these will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. Now, that was Jeremiah, Joel's um, prophecy of the spirit coming. They still don't get it fully. I don't think they got it fully. When you get to Acts chapter 1, Jesus is on the earth. He comes back. He shows himself to the disciples. Acts chapter 1 comes on the scene because Acts kicks off the New Testament. I know y'all believe that Matthew kicks off the New Testament, but it does not. 
In your book, it is called the New Testament. It starts there, but but naturally and technically, the book of Acts kicks off the New Testament. You understand why? Because Jesus then he died and then he was he he was ascending as the Acts of the book of the Acts uh, come on the scene. He's ascending and then the, the veil was rent. Uh, the old covenant was over. The old sea <laughs> was over. All right. The old sea was still going on. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Book of Acts give us the new and better. The new and better covenant is in the book of Acts. And then the gospel is spread throughout the world. Asia Minor and all these other places. So in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do, to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving the chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Ghost. Okay, now, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift that he promised. As I told you before, John the Baptist with water, baptized with water, but in a uh, few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. All right. He said, I told you this. Guess what happens? In verse six, here's where it comes. Mm -hmm. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? They still... We're not expecting him to leave. He had left once because he died. He came back and they just assumed we're good. He's getting ready to restore the kingdom, overtake uh, the Romans and, and the Grecians, okay, and set up his kingdom here on the earth like it was in, in the good old days, back in Solomon days, where there was peace. But he replied, the father alone has the authority to set these those dates and times. And they are not for you to know. Now, that's a slap in the face. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Wait a minute. So we've got to go back to John chapter 20. Because we went ahead of ourselves. You got to go to John chapter 20. Start at the 21st verse. Uh, let's start here at the 19th verse. Jesus is on the earth. He hadn't died yet. Well, he did. The, 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 the Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. So obviously, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace as the father has sent me. So I'm sending you. Then he breathed. There go that wind. There it is. He breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sin, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. He's given them power. Power. Amazing power to do this stuff. How in the world can these disciples have the power to forgive someone's sins and they are forgiven? Great power. And with great power comes great responsibility. So then Acts 1 kicks off, and here's where we go back to where we were. The Father alone has given, has the authority to set those dates, but you will receive power. I blew on you, remember? Yeah, I remember that. Power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that's what they did because the disciples turned the world upside down. After his saying this, he was taken up in a cloud while they were watching. They were uh, they could no longer see him as they strained to see him rising into heaven. Two white robed men. It's always two with Jesus. Why? Because 
things are established, agreements are established and met in the witness of two or three. The two showed up at the sepulchre as, as well, at the grave. The two always with him, accompanying him. Two white robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here starting staring? Okay, or gazing. Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that he came. And, and where is that? I read it to y'all the other day. Where I said his feet hit the Mount Zion and it and it and it's a broken half. Can y'all tell me what book was that for those of you who've been listening? Hmm? He leaves here, but he returns in what book? I read it to y'all. And it's, it's chapter 14 at that. Hmm? Can y'all remember? All right. So now they got to now replace old Judas with Matthias. He shows up here. We see him and then we don't see him no more. <laughs> we don't see him no more. Absolutely, Tam. Jesus gave the disciples power and he also gave us a power as well. Mm -hmm. He gave us power as well. We unfortunately don't believe we have power. And uh, my controversial statement is because we don't believe we have it we can't do much with it how do we know because the bible says that jesus was in the territory and uh he could not do many miracles there and he is jesus christ <laughs> the, the power a very powerful man at the time man a son of man son of god he couldn't do he couldn't do miracles in that town. Can y'all tell me why Jesus, with all that power, could not do many miracles in that town except for uh, one or two, the Bible says? Hmm. Can y'all tell me? Can y'all tell me? And the, the, uh, the, the book that I was telling y'all uh, where Jesus was going to come back is Zechariah. That's right, Cheska, Zechariah. Amber says Ezekiel 38. Mm, no, but I see why you did that. There you go. Jerome got it. Why? Because Jesus could not do any miracles because the people did not believe. Yet Jesus had all power in his hands. So we are given power because we have the Holy Spirit. What good is the Holy Spirit if we can't use it? If, it is, if he has no power to operating in us, what good is it being in this? Hmm? But he can't operate because of our two unbelief. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe him, Doug. And many of us don't believe him either. We don't believe the, the, the power that was given. Mm -hmm. Familiarity breeds contempt. And Jesus could only do what was allotted to him. Same thing here. Y'all understand. Same thing here. So let's look at the power of the Holy Spirit to see what exactly, how does he come? What form does, does he come in? Uh, let's see. Can I find something? Um... I did say I was going to find a, a new board. <laughs> I'm going to find a new board, but I happen to go through all these. I, I, don't, I don't know when I'm going to be drawn. I just go live. Okay, right here. Let's see how he comes. Uh, this, is, this, this is Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, often referred to as Holy Ghost, especially in the, um, in the King James Version. Okay. So let's... Um, Let's see how he comes. He comes number one as as a dove. Okay, he comes as a dove. I think that would be somewhere around Matthew three sixteen. If we open up the book here to Matthew three, Matthew three and sixteen, 
Let's see if I can do all this without it acting a fool on me. Don't know if it's going to work. Matthew 3, 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, heavens were opened up and spirit of God descended like a dove. And lightning upon him. And to a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. All right. So obviously we see that he came in the form of a dove right there. All right. So where else do we see him coming in? Also, we see that the spirit comes in the form of fire. There's different kinds of fire. God is an all-consuming fire. So that same fire you see in hell uh, or the lake of fire, that's still God. All right? But he comes in different kinds and forms. Uh, even the, 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 your works will be burned up in fire as well. Uh, wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious metals, that fire. So the Holy Spirit comes like fire Let's say in Matthew chapter 11, uh, uh, chapter 3, that is, verse 11. And let's see if we can find that right here. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire, fire, Lord, fire, fire, Lord, fire, <laughs> fire, Lord. The winnowing fan. Now, if you are gardeners, if you are farmers, you would know what a winnowing fan is, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge the floor. Anybody know what a floor is? What is the floor? Again, this is King James vernacular. When you read it, and you don't understand agriculture, you wouldn't understand what he's talking about. And gather his wheat into the gardener. All right. These and get you a good study Bible with the numbers next to it. It'll tell you what's going on in verse 12. Go down here and you'll see winnowing fan, threshing floor and the barn. You understand? Now, what is he saying here uh, in, the, in the study notes? In verse 12, let's see if they will. Okay, verse 11, John's baptism is a type of salvation experience of being baptized in the spirit as John baptism placed the individual in the medium of water. We're going to get there in a minute. So the baptism of Jesus places the Christian in the spirit, identifying him as bound over total, over totally to the Lord. Fire either purifies or destroys. Remember I said hell or your works? This is the purification of the fire, Acts chapter 2. When he came in fire, he purified us. Hence, salvation in Jesus Christ will be purifying for the true Jews who accept him as Messiah and destructive for those who reject him. You understand? Okay? The Spirit anointed Jesus for his ministry. The dove symbolizes gentleness, innocence, meekness, and it was offered in sacrifice. There it is, the turtle dove. The gentle innocence and meek Jesus would be sacrificed for sin. Y'all understand? So that would be dove. He comes in fire. Number three. All right. He comes in the form of oil. That would be Exodus 29, maybe, and 7, or Leviticus 8. I'm not going to go there, but obviously the priests were anointed, and so were the kings anointed. King David and King Solomon were anointed by the prophets to serve. We today are anointed with oil. If there's any sick among you, 
you are anointed with oil and the prayers uh, of the righteous a faith will heal you and if there's any sin that that you committed it shall be forgiven you the oil uh, when we lay hands on folks to send them out to ordain them we play we put we lay we pour oil on their heads oil was placed on me when I was ordained by the church um, as an elder, they anointed me with oil to send me out. All right. That's what the Holy Spirit does. All right. Number four. Here is another one. He comes in when we mentioned that earlier. That would be John chapter three and eight. And obviously you see it in today's lesson. OK, so. Let's find it, will we please? Where we at Mark, Luke. Let's find John chapter 3 and 8. Mm -hmm. All right. Hope I'm not bearing, uh, boring you <laughs> here. John chapter 3. Let's start here. Well, you see Jesus... Um, and all of that red going on there. Marvel not that I sh uh, said unto thee, ye must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Then when he gets over here, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. And whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. You don't know where it's coming from. Does that sound familiar? It sure do sound familiar. And where do it sound familiar? It sounds familiar in this book. I told y'all the second, the secular account of they heard this wind blowing. And it was a fair weather day. The sun was shining. There's plenty of light. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay? Where'd that come from? And they all busted the door open, going outside and find, trying to figure out where that coming from. Jesus is saying it right here. The wind comes, the spirit comes, and you don't know where it's coming from. Man, I'm trying to tell y'all how this stuff lines up. <laughs> I don't think y'all understand how, how this stuff lines up. All right, that's the wind. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit comes in number five. He comes in the form of water. Mm -hmm. That is out of John chapter seven. Let's say 37 through 39. You got to go to Isaiah 44 and three. As well, you got to go to Joel, which we did read 2 and 28 through 29. So let's see what John chapter 7 uh, and 37 is saying here. John chapter 7, 37. Oh, yeah, right here. John 7, 37, Christ reveals the living water. In the last day, that great day of peace, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. I put Isaiah 58 here. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of water. Hmm. Now watch this. We've been quoting that since I was a, was, was a boy. Belly. King James says belly. But this is not the belly <laughs> in which we thought it was. This is not where your food go. <laughs> this belly is the heart. Out of your heart. So now when you read it differently, it makes, a, it makes more sense and it makes better sense. He that believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. The woman at the well wanted some natural uh, spring water. Jesus offered her water, living water from the heart. 
You see that? But this spake of he spake he of the spirit which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Y'all see right there. So the water of the Holy Spirit will come. And Jesus spoke of this water a few times with the folks. Y'all see. So these are the five workings or, or forms. They're not so much workings, but the forms of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So now that we've got the historicity of the lesson, it took, it took us a while to get there. Then we go into the lesson. This is how important Bible study is. And this is how you should be studying uh, Bible study by looking at the history of the lesson so that you can understand something that you didn't see before. It's going to show you some stuff that make you fall even deeper in love with God when you really see it the way I'm, I'm showing it to you here. You will see stuff that you never thought you had seen. You didn't know. You're never too old to learn something new. So then when we get into Acts chapter 2, you see on the day of Pentecost. Now when you read it, it makes sense. Now you know what Pentecost is, where it come from, how many days it took to get there. You see what I'm saying? You've got to study the scriptures this way. Study the history first. And then when you read it, it comes to life. If you ever watch a movie, try and watch, try and read the book first, if you can. Then when you watch the movie, you'll be like, oh, I see. But then you'll see that the movie didn't really tell the full story. The movie a lot of times is weak compared to what the book did. <laughs> so, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, that is today's lesson, suddenly, mm -hmm, there was a sound from heaven like a roaring mighty windstorm. Now you get it. Where'd that wind come from? Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? I read it to you in that secular book. Come on, Pastor Collins, like the Ten Commandments <laughs> story, movie that is. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Nobody was playing video games, <laughs> okay? Then what looked like flames or tongues. So when you read it in a different version other than, um, other than King James, you'll see something different. What looked like like okay flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them all of them not some of them when you all are trying to seek the Holy Spirit in a place in a church in the building why is it that it seemed to fall on one or two people when there's 10 15 people on the altar hmm hmm why is that? When here it fell on all of them. Hmm? Were these men and women better than you all who are at your churches today? Hmm? Were they more saved than the folks who have been tearing on the altars when I was coming up? Hmm? Why did these folks in my day and time have to go back and, and, and keep going back to try and receive the Holy Ghost? Because y'all are looking for something that you shouldn't be trying to look for. You know what that is, right? Man, I'm in the wrong house teaching this way. I'm in the wrong house. And everyone present, everybody, everybody present mm -hmm, was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages. Mm -hmm. As the Holy Spirit gave them of the ability. Mm-hmm. I see. Now y'all get it now. At that time, there were devout Jews 
from every nation living in Jerusalem. Wait a minute. These were devout Jews. That's a big, that's a big point right there. Are these people on the altar from the 57 years I've, I've witnessed this? Were they not devout Christians? Why is it that the, 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 the Holy Spirit, the rate of, of, of receiving him was maybe 5%? Hmm? <laughs> huh? Hmm. Now, Tam says maybe it's because the people don't believe. Oh, no, no. Those who are working the altar were looking for proof. That's where the problem is. They were looking for proof at the altar. Herein lies the problem. At the time, there were devout Jews from all over the place. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were speaking in what we know today as tongues. And they were unknown. Well, they were known to the believers that were there, though. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They claimed. These people are all from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Native. You see that? This is not a heavenly tongue, y'all. Here we are, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and people of the Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Prince of the province of uh, Asia, uh, all these other places. They're all over the place. I mean, they give them all of them. The Cretans, the Syrians, the, the Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked. But others in the crowd ridiculed them. They're drunk. That's all. Peter pre preaches the gospel. He said, it ain't drinking time. <laughs> Still in the morning. It ain't even drinking time. They wanted us to fall out on the floor, which they always thought our people received. Yep. Mm hmm. That's the problem. But the end result that they wanted was this tongues. And if you mention Tongues. I mean, if you exemplify, <laughs> if you start speaking in a tongue, then you are good for the rest of your life. They didn't bother you from that moment on. I need y'all to hear me. I need y'all to hear me. If you spoke in the tongue, I don't care how old you were, they left you alone from that moment on. And that was your ticket in an elitist group of tongue speakers. I'm telling y'all, I, I get in trouble. I'm in the wrong house. I'm, I'm, I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong house. To the point where they said to me and many of us coming up, especially the Church of God in Christ and some of the other Pentecostal churches. That if you did not speak in a tongue, it would be hard-fetched for you. Your life would be very difficult. To the point where some were saying that you won't even make it to heaven unless you spoke in a tongue. So what did the young folk do? They did one of two things. Number one, they faked tongues. They faked it because they would, they wanted y'all to leave them alone. Number two, they went on year after year after year after year trying to speak in a tongue to the point where I saw 60 and 70 year old people would get up and testify and say, thank the Lord for being here and being saved, sanctified. Uh, pray that I can speak in tongues and be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
and they will say, you are a candidate for the Holy Ghost. We got a problem. We got a problem. How in the world can you be still a candidate for the Holy Spirit? It baffles me, it baffles me, it baffles me, it baffles me. I will never understand. I'll never understand. First Corinthians, I don't know where I want to go because it baffles me. First Corinthians chapter 12 says something very unusual for those who may not get this fully. But for those of us who understand the concept, we get it. Let's find it and let's read it together. Okay? Because we get it. First Corinthians chapter 12 we can start at the tw at the twelfth verse if you like. Mm -hmm. I know, Pastor Tony. When I was in college, I want uh, to I went to Kojic Church and was told I wasn't saved because I didn't speak in tongues. I was so confused and led. Me. Come on, Monica. Did you did you see what Monica said? I was so confused and it led me to question my salvation. Question my salvation. Wow. Yeah, Alice. Man. I know. Yep, yeah, he's mad. He, he Satan hates me. He's gonna try to attack me tonight. Watch. He's gonna try again. <laughs> but the bunkers will be interceding for me tonight. And he's gonna be upset again. <laughs> Cause the bunkers got me. Right here. Watch this. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. All right? Mm -hmm. There's Dinah. There's our sweetheart. There's, there's our baby. <laughs> there's our baby. I told y'all, Dinah is the bunker's baby. <laughs> It's about two two hundred of us, but Dinah is the baby. Um, look at this, the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews. Some of us are Gentiles. Some are slaves. Some are free i get to read this slow <laughs> i gotta read this slow slow but we have look at that word right there let me blow it up for you <laughs> you don't see that y'all saw that right they they don't want to read this part and then when they do read it, they're going to they gonna spin the heck out of it. We have all, not those who tarry on the altar, not them. Not just them. We all been what? Baptized. Mm. Into one body. One spirit. We all share the same spirit. Well, I'll be. <laughs> well, I'll be. We've all been baptized. As soon as you receive Christ in your life, you are all baptized. Sealed. And then there's a feeling that happens. Which I look at the feeling as something that is ongoing. No tongues are required. 
No tongues are required. Y'all like, uh oh, Brother Jones, you you don't you do not love your life. <laughs> All right. Let's see if the scriptures back me up. Let's see if the scriptures back me up. Let's see. Chapter 12, I think I'm already there. And the 29th verse, is it here? Okay. Here's why I'm going to back myself up. <laughs> Are we all apostles? No. Are we all prophets? No. Are we all teachers? No. Do we all have the power to do miracles? No. Do we all have the gift of healing? No. Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages or tongues? No. 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 Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? No. He says, of course not. Mm -mm. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Because tongues may not be helpful for you when you're in a room full of all English speakers. <laughs> why? Why would, you need, why would you need a tongue when everybody in the room understood you when you first started to speak? Why, why would you need? He said, seek the most helpful. If I'm in a room that, of my multilingual folks, uh, you know, from all over the world, then yeah, I seek that helpful gift. That would be tongues. This really upsets the saints. I'm in the wrong house. I keep telling y'all that. I'm in the wrong house. Yes, I am. So, right here, all right, Acts chapter 2, the footnotes, Pentecost. This is the recap. Was an annual Jewish festival, also known as the Feast of Weeks, or the Day of First Fruits. You all are the first part of that, 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 that bringing up the rear part. A celebration of the first buds of the harvest. Jewish men were required by law to go to Jerusalem three times each year to celebrate the major feasts. Passover in the spring, Pentecost or Pentecostals, 50 or seven weeks and the day later. In tabernacles at the end of the harvest in the fall. Details, dates, the dates and rituals of the Jewish festival calendar. Those who became Christians on Pentecost were the first fruits of a vast harvest of millions of souls. What did I tell y'all? On the day of Pentecost, we became, through them, part of the first fruits of a vast harvest of millions of souls. So whoever's teaching first fruits and you don't include these people, and you only include in money, we got a problem. As of a rushing mighty wind, not a wind, but like the sound of a wind, John 8. The mighty but unseen power of the Spirit. John the Baptist foretold how Spirit baptism would be accomplished by wind. I read all of this stuff to y'all. This may also be an allusion to the burning bush, Exodus 3, which was a symbol of the divine presence. This outward manifestation of the spirit is coming, uh, of the spirit's coming was another sign of his power. Oh, it goes on and on. Other tongues here refers to spoken human languages unknown to the speakers, but known by others. Y'all see that? Known. A distinct practice of the Spirit's fulfillment that evolves, evolved at some later, later, later point in the development of the church. 
Uh, it goes on and on. It's it's a lot there. It's a lot. It's some good stuff. Get you a good study Bible. A lot of good stuff right there. Mm hmm. Oh, they go deep here. They they get a little controversial here, but they 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 go deep in there. All right. Get you a good study Bible, and you'll get it. Is this making sense to any of you? So how can you be a candidate for someone who's already came? He not he didn't come and then leave again. First Corinthians says we are all baptized in one body, one spirit. How are you still a candidate? We've been lied to. We've been really lied to. I feel bad because many people have went to their graves feeling that they never received the power and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They went to their graves believing that they never had the Spirit. They felt that they had God, but they had they had the Holy they, they had Jesus Christ, but they didn't have the Spirit. So they felt that they were incomplete. Amazing. And God, he's, he judged the church for that. He, he, he's judging the church because of that mess. First fruits is the Feast of Weeks. There you go. Rogers is putting it there. All right. Question, I think I got time for the question of the day. All right. Tasha Miles asked the question, what is the difference between uh, of being baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit? Can somebody answer that? What is the difference between ba being baptized and filled? Hmm. I want somebody to answer that. Okay. Baptized is to submerge is that how you spell it sub sub oh, submerge <laughs> is that a you there submerge and when you are submerged especially in water you are fully covered that means there is a hedge of protection around you hedge so when satan went to attack job satan said to god that you have a hedge of protection around him that's what baptizing does it does two two things we are baptized and we are sealed like a submarine mm -hmm. like a submarine so the submarine has sealants in it so that when it is submerged, water can't get in. So a baptism is recovered. That's why 1 Corinthians and what Paul says, he says, so therefore we all are baptized. There's nothing you have to do or speak out of your mouth. The evidence of the having the Holy Spirit is not tongues. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the, y'all already know, Spirit. There is no S with fruits. There's nine of them suckers. Mm -hmm. You understand? That's when you know the evidence because people, many of them who speak in tongues, uh, lie. They, I've seen them cheating on their spouses, cheating on their taxes. They are very mean people, honorary. They don't speak to you. And they at church going, he, t, 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 t. And I work with them on the job on Monday morning and they are the worst they are the worst of citizens <laughs> in America. The worst. 
So tongues is not the evidence. The fruit of the spirit is. Y'all, I'm in the wrong house. I'm in the wrong house. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then what happens with the feeling, that's when that supernatural power comes over you. That's when the, the strength comes over you and you're able to do some things. The Holy Spirit then um, uses you to do miraculous things. That's why I say it's, it's an ongoing, it can be an ongoing process and you can turn into Samson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you could turn into Samson. And he walks and he walks with you and he talks with you and he tells you, I am. OK, that's that feeling right there, man. And it does some things. It, it lets you see into stuff that others can't see into. That that power, that dudamus that y'all would bring up by God. OK. Yeah, that's that's that that thing right there. Man, you you cast out demons with, with, with that one. All right? That's the feeling. But as soon as you receive the Lord, you baptize and you're kept. You're kept. Understand? When you once you're baptized, you're you're sanctified. That means you are set apart that means you are anointed anointed doesn't mean that you go into a church and tear down because you know how to sing and preach no anointed simply means to be set apart ordained chosen that's what an anointed is y'all overly glorified it, over romanticized what anointing is. The sheep, they're anointed with oil, okay? And their head's anointed with oil because of the bug problem. <laughs> There's a bug problem. And the oil go down the sheep's uh, head and because the bugs go into the ears of the sheep and in in the eyes of the sheep, all right, and in the mouth, what have you, and it chokes the sheep, and it could kill the sheep, and so the shepherd would anoint the sheep with oil. I don't think y'all getting this. So when you send somebody more anointed than this other person, you got that from your father, mother, uh, my dear, Auntie Benny, some denomination, we are all anointed. That means we are set apart to do God's work. We are all baptized. This is not an elitist work. This is not some country club, but only those who pay their tithes and offerings be a part of. All of us have it. You understand? Mm -hmm. And this is why when um, King Saul... King Saul was acting a fool trying to kill David. We know that King Saul was a, was a foolish man. He was honorary. He wasn't saved. But David would not return evil for evil to Saul. Can y'all tell me why? Hmm? Can y'all tell me why? Why wouldn't he? Because even after Saul died, David were up, was upset with the armor bearer who claimed that he took Saul's life. David was upset. What was his words? Hmm? What was his words? Thank you, Tam Tamar. Alexander, he was anointed. He was anointed. Ah. All right, hold on. All right. I 
Trying to answer y'all's questions. Explain the experience of Cornelius, how they know the Spirit had fallen upon them. Acts chapter 10. Mm -hmm. Ah. <laughs> Man, you. <laughs> Tony Collins. I see what you're trying to do here, man. You're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> I, he says, I will not touch Saul because um, he is set aside. He has been anointed by God. Even though God did not want Saul to be the king, y'all wanted him to be the king. God didn't want him. Uh, pick up my food. Hold on, that's my daughter. Hold on. Everything stops for Rebecca. Everything. Everything stops for Rebecca. Okay. All right. Somebody asked me, who was it? T Tam Alexander, you asked the question, why was the disciples asked, have you, re have you received the, the Holy Ghost since you believe? That's a good question. Uh, let, let's, let's try and find it. Mm. Acts, what is it, 19? Okay. I think it's Acts chapter 19. All right. Let's go there. And David said unto him, How was thou not afraid to stretch forth? Ooh, come on, Jerome Herod. Uh-huh. David had that man killed for gloating about the... Yeah, God's... Come on. Y'all, them bunkers, boy. Y'all some crazy preachers. <laughs> Y'all some crazy preachers. All right. Let's answer uh, our dear sister uh, Tamara's question the best way we can. And trust me, all answers are, are not necessarily received as I agree. <laughs> but it it takes too long for me to go into detail on some of the questions here because it would take a whole show to do some of these questions. So let's do this. Come on, perfect. And you come on. When you know when you say let's fail, Dick, I know you got some good teachers. Uh, was it because these men were disciples? Up oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. I, I don't need to do this then. <laughs> All right. While Apollos, wait, did I? Let me take a snapshot of this because the the Bible always, you know, <laughs> the Bible gives you clues and it, it interprets itself. It really does. All right. Good night, Natasha. She gonna come up here, drop bombs and go to sleep. <laughs> uh, let's see. What did Simon the sorcerer see in reference to the Holy Spirit upon those uh, that made <laughs> Tony Collins? What did they, man, I like Tony. Tony, man, Tony, man I can't, I'm a, you know, these would be great questions for tomorrow. I know what Tony's doing, <laughs> but I want to save these for tomorrow. These are great ones. <laughs> let, me do, let me do Tam. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. He said, who me? <laughs> no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. All right. History and culture culture helps us understand this text here because tongue speakers love to beat up teachers like me and they always go here they won't go to where it says all do not speak in tongues they won't go there no they're afraid to go there but they will always go here which means they're telling me that the bible is going against itself the bible is going against itself. And they don't even realize that when they try to go against this type of teaching, that they are pinning the Bible against itself. Then they said, 
Then what bap he asked, then what baptism did you experience? What baptism did you experience? Why would he ask that? Because they said we had never heard of such a Holy Ghost, even though we are believers. And they replied, the baptism of John. There it is. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in one who could come later. That means Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Uh, then when Paul laid hands on them, mm, did y'all see that? As soon as they heard this, they were baptized. And then after that, <laughs> when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues. Wait a minute. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm confused. And prophesied there were about 12 men in all. I'm so confused. Why am I confused, y'all? Huh? And I want to see if, uh, yeah, uh, there's some notes here. I haven't read in, in my Bible here. I'm going to read the notes. But wait a minute. Let's go back. Didn't I not tell y'all that a person is baptized at the moment that they believe? Mm -hmm. So he's saying, they're saying here, as soon as they uh, heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, were they baptized in water? Hmm? Mm. Then when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And then they spoke in tongues. We've got some ambiguity going on here. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> okay now remember I told y'all the word culture is very important well Jews it's 11 o'clock so if these were Jews that means the Jews had to experience something and what do the Jews require? <laughs> because baptism comes in both water and spirit, and they both are signs of what? Of conversion. And you who are Gentiles don't require signs of conversion. You don't require it. Mm -hmm. You don't require it. The scripture says the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. So if you are always chasing the world, chasing God, looking at the signs, this becomes like a works-based religion in a sense. You always got to see something. No. Then what happened to your faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of stuff that is not signs, not seen. <laughs> so if you continue walking around this earth looking for signs and, and tongues and what have you, where is your faith? So Jesus told them, listen, there's, there's some, the, the folk is not of my fold. And there's the people, uh, he said, uh, uh, Thomas, listen, you see me and you believe, but there are those who don't, won't see me, yet they will believe. Mm. Oh, wow. I said that at the same time Dinah was typing it. I told y'all, Dinah is our baby. <laughs> Dinah is our baby. Okay, without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. These disciples, I think there were eight, eight, 18 to 16 of them. I, I can't remember. They required, they had to speak. 
that was a sign that it wasn't just about John. Let's see what my uh, my thing, my book here says. Upon arriving at Ephesus, Paul finds a group of disciples, a clear indication that they are true baptized Christians whose knowledge about the Holy Spirit is defective. Their teachers knew some basics of Christianity from contact with John the Baptist, but they were apparently unaware of the development of Pentecost. Ah, y'all see what Paul is doing to them? They were unaware. We are well aware they were not. Therefore, these disciples had only been baptized under John's baptism. This indicates that their conversion experience was accompanied by the knowledge that a fuller experience with the Holy Spirit would come, Matthew 3, but without the realize, realize, realization that it had come. It already came. Paul remedies by rebaptizing them, what? In water. The only such account in the whole New Testament. <laughs> And by leading them into a fuller experience with Holy Spirit. Mm. An obvious parallel to the day of Pentecost. The Spirit's fullness is displayed by their speaking in tongues and prophesying. So what, what does this mean? They were not a part of the Pentecost. And so Paul says, all right, you missed the meeting. So I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to make you a part of the meeting. Number two, Paul said... I did not come to baptize any of you. Do y'all remember when he said that? Somebody find it for me, will you please? <laughs> will you please? Will you please? And I know, man, this stuff here causes folks to fight. Calls people to fight. It causes us all to just fight, fight, fight. But you can't argue the scriptures. That's why at the beginning of the show, I says, let's talk about the history of the lesson. Once you understand the history of the lesson, then you can read it and it makes more sense. I didn't come to baptize any of y'all, but, and then he gave the names of those who he baptized. And then he moved on with his conversations. Oh, by the way, and then I baptized this person and this person. Mm. She says, other than that, I don't remember baptizing nobody else. Well, Paul, you baptized these guys, John the Baptist folks. Remember them? You baptized them. Mm -hmm. And this, this is the only time we see where Paul had to baptize them in water. And then the Holy Spirit fell upon them so that they could be, so they can speak. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 1, 14. All right, we'll do that, and, and we better shut this down because I did have one more question that did come to me, and um, I told y'all this was going to be long. This is y'all's fault. <laughs> this is, this is y'all's fault. Uh, First Corinthians 1, I think. Okay, 17. Doo -doo -doo. There it is right there. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. Wow. Right here. Has Christ been divided? No. He says, uh, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. Gaius. For now... No one can say that they were baptized in my name. Oh, oh, yeah, he says, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. But I don't remember baptizing anybody else until I reminded him that he baptized these other men. All right. So is baptism essential for salvation? Here's another problem. Is baptism essential for salvation? Because if it is, why would Paul... Say, I wasn't sent to baptize nobody. All right. 
One more question. Uh, one of our bunkers did ask a question. Who was it? Brian Williams. I love Brian Williams. Not the NBC man. No, not not him. <laughs> not him. This this is our dear brother Brian. Love this man. He likes a he he's a faithful bunker. And uh, one of the days I'm gonna break bread with him. It's a good man right there. I've always heard save sanctify. Let me see where are we. What is what is this question? Uh, I've always heard saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and fire baptized. But when John talks about the one coming after will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire, aren't these two different things? Okay, I did answer that one. All right. Um, I asked some. Oh, he says it was about if I be lifted, I will draw all unto me. I said I believe the all. There is not men. It's condemnation. All right. So he believes that I'll draw all men to me is not about men, but it's about condemnation. Focus on John chapter 12, verse 31. Okay. It's judgment. John chapter. Oh, let's let's go here. John chapter 12. Put that there. Roger. John chapter 12. Uh, verse 31 is that where he going um let's uh let's let's do it in the in the written word here so that we can see if we can answer john chapter 12 he believes that i'll draw all men to me is 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 it's not saying what we think it's saying all right Bear with me. Let's see if we can find something that might help help John 12. <clears throat> Thank y'all for bearing with us. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 31. Um, if I be lifted up, okay. Let's do this. Let's go to Bible Hub. Google. Give me John chapter 12, 32, please. And let's go to the Bible Hub. And let's see what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go here. Well, first of all, look what he's saying. Let's go back. It starts here. Here's a clue. The triumphal entry. That's the clue right there. On the next day. On the next day. He, he does something symbolic here. He's getting ready to show who he is. All right. And then he teaches. The hours come that the son of man should be glorified. Okay. Look what he's doing. He getting ready to help some folk. Here's where the question comes in. They stood by and heard said that it, uh, it thundered. Others said an angel spoke. This voice came not because of me but for your sakes now is the judgment of this world now shall the prince of this world be cast out this is where our dear brother is focusing on here thinking that him Jesus is, is drawing about judgment and I if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me he says because men is is uh, is an italicized that it was added. Okay, I, I see what he mean by that. All right. Here though it says this is this he said signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, "We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever." And how sayest thou? 
the Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is a light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. All right? Mm -hmm. So, let's go to all of the other translations. And let's see what it says. Right here, we see, and I, oh, let me do this so that I can save it. Let's save it. Hold on. Because I want to see. Mm -hmm. You all are very patient. Thank you. Thank you for being patient. Right here. Uh oh. Hold on. I lost it. Okay, right here. Hold on. I don't know where I, I lost my. Um, hold on. Okay, there I go. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people. Let's look at all of the translations here. All people. I will draw everyone. I will draw all people. I will draw everyone. I will draw all to myself. Okay. Now I know he said that men was added. Okay. If he, even if it was, it's telling us that these other words doesn't change the meaning. Peoples, peoples, men, men. Look what the Amplified says. And if, if, and when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, will draw all people to myself, Gentiles as well as Jews. This doesn't sound like judgment. I'll draw all people, all people, all men, everyone. Every, I will make everyone want to come to me. See what's happening here? All men to myself. To me, to myself, to me, to myself. All right. These are all of the translations. They all seem to add up to the same thing. And when you um, when you look at Ellicott's, when you read it and pulpit commentary, they seem to say the same thing. This is straight salvation. This is this is not judgment. Why do we say this? Why do we believe this? This is not judgment. Well, it's not judgment uh, because Jesus dying on the cross was has everything to do with the analogy that I, I made when I told y'all that we do not plead the blood. Mm -hmm. We do not we do not plead the blood. And that that's this is where I get in trouble. <laughs> All right. Because. When you're pleading the blood, you're putting Jesus back on trial. Why was Jesus on trial? He was on trial um, for the sins of man. Okay. Satan was already, he already had his trial. Right. S Satan already. Satan already had his trial and he was sentenced to life in the lake of fire. All right. Jesus came here to clean up this mess, the mess that Adam had given and Adam and Eve. So he's called the second or last Adam. So he was put on trial. Jesus became the propitiation or the sacrificial lamb, all right, that had to clean up this stuff, all right, because the Old Testament talks about when the sin is committed, the person must um, present a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice, that is, and kill it. Because without 
the remission of sin, there is uh, there must be a, a shedding of blood for the remission of sin. All right, the book of Hebrews. All right, so Jesus had to become that blood for the sins, not so much judgment. He says, if I be lifted up on this cross, then all of your sins I will. Uh, it, I, I, I could, I can, I will wipe them out, but it's really up to you after that, because John then said the most popular one is that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, did Him doing that save the whole world? Well, yes and no. It only saved the world if the world wanted. That's why He continued by saying, "For those who believe, if you believe." So then the scriptures picked it up and said that while we were yet saved, he died for us. Oh, while we were yet sinners, he commended himself, his love towards us. You understand? Come on. Come on. Y'all got this. The timeline of Paul's teaching reveals a change of perspective from his revelation and experiences. Oh, man, y'all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, we love you, but we can't. I said Jesus dying on the cross will draw all men, uh, be people to him by his finished work he did. Yes, and clear, yep. We can't attribute this, attribute, I'm sorry, this scripture to a word which is not hermeneutically correct. Mm -hmm. Like the brass snake, there it is in the wilderness that was lifted up. And that's where it come from, the brass snake. The brass snake wasn't judgment. The brass snake was healing for those people. Look and live. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah, a message for my friend for you. It's recorded in his word. Okay, y'all get it. <laughs> y'all got it. That's exactly it. So it's, so it's not judgment. It's salvation if you want it. All right? And so when Jesus didn't die on the Christ, <laughs> he died on the cross. <laughs> Then death and hell and the sting of death. What happened? Mm, mm, mm. I know it took me a long time to answer that, but it was just a great, it was such a great question. I had to deal with that. So I wrote this song here, 19, I don't know, it might be 1987. Uh, uh, um, Acts chapter 2. When it, when the day of Pentecost surely come. I don't know if I remember the words. <laughs> they were all in one, one chord, in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. And the feel all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them and there appeared unto them cloven tongue like as a fire. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them the torrents. Began to prophesy. See visions and dreams. Then the choir says, Cloven tongues like fire, a rushing my to win. What's up? Feel the house. 
Final state. A rushing mighty wind Feel and anoint us again And they were filled with the Holy Ghost Filled with the Holy Ghost Oh, it goes on and on, y'all. <laughs> It <laughs> goes on and on. Can you imagine a three-part harmony, a 50-voice choir doing that? Oh, it's just so beautiful. I'm going to have to go back and revisit that. And then if they do a little bridge there, they look a little, a little uh, special. Let your spirit anoint me So I can dream dreams Let your spirit anoint me Oh man, it was a great song. <laughs> it was a great song. I had to lower the key because I had a soprano singing it. It was another key. When the day of Pentecost has fully come, they went all the car in one place. Oh yeah, it's, it's too high, too high, too high, <laughs> too high. Man, I tell you, I miss, I miss, I miss my quiet days. I'm gonna have to go back and revisit that song. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't steal it. It's, it's already been copywritten. So if you if you want to take it, I'm going to sue you. I always say here, no other way to end a Saturday night but with nourishing bread of worship. Hey, man, Dinah, the baby has spoken, y'all. The baby has spoken. I'm going to need you to finish that song. Oh, it's finished. I just not going to finish it, singing it tonight. <laughs> she said, don't play with us. <laughs> don't play with us. Right. I should have uh, did a quick recording of it before I go, went live, and then I could have showed y'all the, the three harmonies. Three harmonies. Oh, I'll tell you, my favorite part is. And they were filled with the Holy. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Began to speak with other tongues. And the Spirit gave them utterance. Began to prophesy, see visions and dreams. Oh man, clothing tongues like fire. Yeah, oh rushing mighty wind. Man, I gotta go, y'all. I gotta go. Listen, y'all go to Faith Temple Evanston dot org. We went long tonight. I told y'all, I warned y'all two hours ago. I said, we're going long. And y'all still with me. I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, go to pitchableleverson.org and you can give to the ministry. And we do what we do every Saturday night, y'all. We went late tonight because we can. And tomorrow, uh, uh, Sunday morning, we'll be, the four of us will be out here, the four old folks crew, <laughs> and we'll be teaching this. Obviously not as long as I did, and obviously not as detailed as I did, but it will be a nice recap from 9.30 until 10.30. All right? Faith Temple Evanston on face, Facebook. Mm-hmm. All right? Let me go, y'all. Tell we meet. Tell we meet again. Since I got the piano, why not? Tell we meet at Jesus' feet.
be all over in the morning, don't you know? Part of once put you back together, don't you know? Never let go the church say Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been breathing when we shall leave this place. Mm -hmm. Don't you never let go when we shall Plenty bit for the Holy Spirit. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah, y'all. You know, I get the plan. I can't stop. Brenton says, 61 keys. Make it work. <laughs> I used to pull out my 88. My 88 is over there somewhere. I used to pull that out, but it takes up the whole, it takes up the whole desk. And it's kind of hard. I got to go over here to play the... <laughs> I gotta go over there and play the rest of the keys. So I bought me a little small little Casio. It does the job. That little 60, that little 60 key right there, plus one. It does the work. Did I not make it work? I talk to y'all tomorrow, tomorrow night, nine o'clock. Okay, Central Standard Time. Uh yeah, we had two hours. Good. We made it. Take care. Send the school. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell notification so you'll know that we uh live and uh 
and uh, you can spread the gospel all over the world, um, all over the world. Bye bye. Santa school. Uh, marching on. When the storm clouds form, hear the cries of doom and gloom. Sunday school still marches on. Then when the grass turn green and the flowers start to bloom, Sunday school still marches on. Marches on. Marches on. Sunday school still marches on, marches on, marches on. Sunday school still marches, Sunday school still marches, Sunday school still marches on.